Welcome back to Big Riff Energy. It is Tuesday, March 26th. This is episode 55. Today, we will be talking about Solitude Eternus. Saw these guys on Friday at uh, Hell's Heroes, the sixth installment of the, uh, what I would say is the United States' best metal festival at this point. Went down to Houston just to see these guys. For those of you unfamiliar with Solitude Eternus, don't feel bad. It's embarrassing how long it took me to discover these guys despite having played in multiple doom metal bands over the course of my big riff journey. Uh, you're all familiar, I'm going to assume, with the big four of doom metal. On the east coast, you had Pentagram. On the west coast, you had St. Vitus. In the Midwest, you had Trouble. And overseas in Sweden, you had Candlemas. I think Solitude Eternus is better than all of those bands. And we're going to get into why that is. Doing a deep dive. There are very few bands that I feel are uh, worthy of dedicating an entire episode to their catalog and their history and their music. Uh, but Solitude Eternus is one of them. They're one of my favorite metal bands. They were great in Houston. So that's what we're doing. I looked, uh, I saw that Radio Free Innsmouth just put out a Trouble episode. And I was thinking if anybody's done a deep dive on Solitude, it would be that guy. And I don't think that he has. I looked through his videos. I, I didn't see one. So as far as I know, this might be the first podcast slash YouTube video deep dive on one of the greatest and most overlooked metal bands of all time, Solitude Returns. So we'll crack into that in a minute. Uh, I'm going to answer some emails at the end of this. Got some fun ones today. And uh, I guess I don't want to get too far into like a festival review of Hell's Heroes, but I guess I probably should at least give a mini review. Uh, drove down Friday afternoon. And okay, let me, I'll give a, I'll give a rating just right out of the gate. I'll give the festival an A. Uh, I just went as a fan. I bought a ticket like everybody else. Uh, you know, sometimes you go to things as, I don't know, you get a hookup or whatever, and you kind of have like a more of a curated experience or like a fancy, whatever. I, I just wanted to go as a fan. Because at the end of the day, that's what I am. That's what I'll always be. Fan is short for fanatical. And by the end of this episode, you will see that that's true. Uh, I, I kind of want to just get a feel for it as the same as anybody who just buys a ticket and goes. So, Fest, I'll give an A. I will give an A. Uh, objectively speaking, as a fan of metal, I think it is the the best collection of bands that any festival in the United States has to offer for sure. Uh, you know, it started off more just kind of exclusively traditional metal and that sort of thing. And now it's just, uh, encapsulates all corners of what I would call legitimate or real metal. So the fest gets an A, the merch line gets an F minus just as <laughs> no surprise to anybody that was there. Uh, you know, I ran into some friends I hadn't seen in a long time. Shout out Hassan, Ripping Headaches, one of the coolest uh, promoters in the country. Great guy. But he was waiting in, in line to get some Watchtower stuff, and I hadn't seen him in a long time, so of course I'm going to wait with him. But uh, God, y'all got to get that figured out, man. It it. Let's see, we're in the merch line for all of Hellstar's set. And then the changeover. And I think there might even been another band. And then most of Watchtower's set. I would say I was waiting in that line for an hour and a half. Uh, which was fine because I wanted to catch up with, with my boy Hassan anyway. But also it, there were like three gals working merch for like every band that played the fest. And then there was a bunch of bunch of dudes like on the other side of the booth just standing around. It's kind of a metaphor for uh, 
the patriarchy or something. I don't know. Not great optics, man. Get your boys to fucking work. Uh, so anyway, merch line F minus for sure. Uh, I did get this cool solitude to turn a shirt with festival information on the back. Uh, but no, the fest was cool, man. I, I literally just went to see solitude, but I did see some other bands. Hellstar sounded fine. Uh, Watchtower was cool. You know, Watchtower, uh, is kind of the first progressive metal band ever from Austin, Texas. Jason McMaster went on to be kind of a big deal, uh, with that eighties hair band or whatever. And, uh, it was cool to see a, a band fiercely divide the crowd. People were either like really, really into it or completely confused and almost disgusted walking away. So that was cool. I love to see, uh, I love to see bands elicit like really strong reactions one way or the other, you know, but watching Watchtower is pretty evident how much influence they had on Chuck Schuldner, especially for the later period death stuff. And even probably like Metallica and justice for all. I think they're just, uh, overlooked for their influence. They had on maybe more extreme kind of bands that would follow. Uh, I went inside. Let's see who does see inside Stygian crown. Cool band, doom band, big soaring, epic vocals. That was good. I, I was interested. There was one other band I was interested in seeing apart from Solitude, and it's uh, Lamp of Murmur. I, I dig aspects of their last record. I do think that there are some unfortunate aspects of their last record. I think it's sort of representative of a new school approach to putting out records that I look at as kind of cutting corners. Uh, I could be wrong about this. If somebody hears this and knows better than, than I do reach out and correct me, but it's pretty obvious to me that there are fake drums on the newest lamp of murmur record, which I'm not, you know, fundamentally opposed to program drums. My three favorite typo negative records have programmed drums. Uh, but you have to, when you're doing that, especially if you're going to put it out as a, what you're calling a record, you have to put a little more effort into it. You have to mix it or you have to at least have somebody that knows how to, that really actually knows how to mix a record. And the only way you really actually know how to mix a record is by putting in years of experience in a recording studio. I, I wouldn't even count like a home recording setup as a recording studio. I, I don't think it's possible to just be self-taught at home on how to mix a record legitimately. I think you have to go to a real recording studio with real equipment, old school compressors. And, uh, you know, I'm becoming more open to technology and amp simulators and helix and stuff like that. So, you know, tape machines, that's, that's optional, but if you want to learn how to mix a record, you have to work in a recording studio. I've, I firmly believe that. But, you know, there's this new school approach of sort of doing like home recordings and putting it out as if it's a proper record. And I just don't buy that. You know, you have newer bands talking about how they tracked guitars for their record on a laptop with a Scarlet you know, interface, which is what I'm using to record this podcast. And, um, it sounds like you did. It sounds like you did. And that last lamp of murmur record, I, I like the riffs and stuff, but there just wasn't enough effort put into the, the drums. Like when you're programming drums, you have to, you have to put some time into it. You can change certain aspects of it. There's a setting called velocity that you can, play with to make it sound more human you know you can move stuff around kind of make it imperfect or you know mix it as if it's a real drum kit and i just felt like none of that was done on that last record but i was willing to keep an open mind and see these guys live uh i debated whether i wanted to like call them out by name and and do this little mini review but they uh had a full room filling up with fog uh, at a tightly scheduled festival 
with Solitude Eternus playing right after them outside. Despite the room being full this entire time, they hit the stage 12 or 15 minutes late. I feel like once you've done that, anybody can say anything they want about your band. So here's what I'm going to say. Uh, they filled up the room with fog, made everybody wait. People were getting impatient. And playing devil's advocate, there's situations where, where it's appropriate to start your set late. Uh, you know, I've been on tours where we're direct support to somebody and they tell us to wait. Or they're pushing the whole show 15 minutes to let more people get there. Or, you know, an opening band played over their set time. And so we're kind of given the go ahead to play later and play longer. Um, that's understandable. But I feel like when you're at a, at a fest that's got a super tight schedule and there's a band that hasn't played a show in 13 years playing after you and you know it and most of the people there are there to see that band <laughs> and you hit the stage 15 minutes late we'll call it 12 I'll be I'll be generous and call it 12 minutes late uh yeah you're opening yourself up to any criticism that anyone might have of you here's my criticism you built up all this tension you filled the room with smog fog and smoke and God knows what else. Hippie stuff. These guys come out in crazy costumes and say some weird shit into the microphone in a creepy horror movie goblin voice about the seal being broken or something. So my point is there's all this tension building and this impatience. And if you're going to do all that, when you hit that first note, you better take off everybody's head that's in that room. You better cause like a natural disaster in that room. If you're going to come out that late in costumes and say shit about the seal has been broken or whatever, who knows what the fuck that means. Maybe the seal was broken, but it was broken 12 minutes too late. Uh, yeah, it better be like a nuclear explosion going off once you hit that first note. And it wasn't. It sounded like Dick Dale. If you don't know who Dick Dale is. Imagine the Pulp Fiction. On track. Straight up Telecaster Dick Dale guitar tone with Goblin screaming over the top of it. So I just walked out. I don't know. I wanted to go get a good spot for Solitude. Uh, so that's my review of the Fest minus the review of the Solitude set. Uh, I give the Fest an A, man. I mean, it's... Christian Larson's doing the Lord's work. Best fest in America, like I said. So, let's talk about Solitude Eternus. First of all, uh, it was an amazing performance. They seemed to... They played outside. I got mixed feelings about outdoor stages. Because uh, it can be real difficult to dial a sound. It was super windy. and um, They were facing a lot of mix issues guitar issues I think Edgar and John Perez both had guitar issues at some point uh, but fortunately they, they're they a three guitar lineup now and man sometimes those are the really magical sets when you feel like you are just pushing a boulder up a hill it'll bring something out of everybody you know just a determination and a perseverance and um I mean this as the highest possible compliment when referring to a live metal band or a live rock band. They had the elder statesman vibe, the old man heaviness and the old man determination, the been there, done that kind of thing, sort of the opposite of the vibe of Lamp of Murmur. Like these are guys who have earned it the hard way, you know? So, of course, they're going to have guitar issues. Of course, they're going to have monitor issues. Of course, they're going to have mix issues. That's part of the gig. They started their set on time. They played their exact allotted set time. Uh, the transitions from song to song were smooth. There is a heaviness and a weight that comes out of guys that have been doing it for decades uh, that can only be earned. 
by slinging big riffs for decades. Their catalog was well represented. We'll dive into their catalog here in a minute. I'm going to do, do my deep dive. Yeah, they, their three best albums, they played three songs each. First three albums, right? Um, Downfall is sort of the black sheep of their catalog. Didn't play anything from that. I'm sure Arthur Rizik was very disappointed. I know how much he loves that record. Uh, and it's not a bad record. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, the last two records, Adagio and Alone, they played one track from each of those. So I, if you're unfamiliar with Solitude, I would sort of liken that to if you saw Metallica and they played like three songs from Ride the Lightning, Puppets, and Justice, and one song from the Black Album, and like one song from the New Album. Great set. Great, like perfect uh, representation of their whole catalog. And man, I'll go, I'll throw the set list up here and you saw the album representation. Uh, they started with stuff from the first album, which I thought was cool. And played some stuff from the second, third album, then sort of broke into the, the later period stuff. I would have loved to have hear, heard uh, Transcending Sentinels from the first album. I think that's one of the strongest songs on there. And from the third album, Through the Darkest Hour, I would have loved to hear the first track. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Solitude Eternus and you're not particularly into Doom, like first wave Doom or epic Doom, really traditional like Doom metal, not modern Doom, not like Burning Witch ripoff, but with no riffs and 12 minute songs. I'm talking about like first wave traditional Doom. Uh, if if you are into that, start with the first album, Into the Depths of Sorrow, and just go from there. Every album's good. Uh, if you're not into that, and you want to get into Solitude Eternus, listen to the first song on the third album. It's called Falling. If they were ever going to have a radio hit in the 90s, that's it, man. It uh, They didn't, they didn't like sell out on their own style or anything like that. It's very much like they didn't betray the soul of their sound, but it's pretty clear. They're trying to write like a concise, it's a great song. It's just a great song. Uh, and it very much represents their, their sound and the soul of the band, but it's got like a little bit of extra Alice in Chains vibes, you know, a little bit of extra Arlington, Texas, borderline Pantera type of shit, you know? Uh, so if you want to hear these guys before we jump into this deep dive and you're completely unfamiliar with them, listen to that song Falling. Uh, they didn't play it. Kind of disappointed, but I went back to 2011, which was the last time they played concerts and watched them play Falling. And it, I can see why they didn't play it. I, th I think it's maybe a little bit too weird to to translate into a live setting for whatever reason um so yeah here we go solitude eternus if you guys want some uh supplemental reading by the way my friend brad sanders who i love he's always been very kind to spirit adrift he wrote an article and did an interview with john perez and robert lowe from solitude eternus for a publication called Cron, C H R O N. But check that out. It's a great little piece. Very well written and informative. So I said at the beginning of this, we're all familiar with the big four of Doom Metal. And I guess if you want to back it up to the origins, of course, this subgenre, and I would argue every subgenre of metal, was created by Black Sabbath, 1969, 1970 is when it was put to record, right? The first Black Sabbath album, the first song on it, Black Sabbath, is the first metal song, I think, and it's more specifically the first doom metal song. Uh, Paranoid, the next album, sort of expanded the template for doom metal. Songs like Electric Funeral, Hand of Doom, I mean, Doom's in the damn name of the song, right? Elect uh what did I say? Electric Funeral? Yeah, Iron Man. 
uh, master of reality, they really sort of focused in on this dark, epic, tragic, sludgy. You know, they they tune the guitars down to C sharp standard to make it even heavier. Uh, I think the penultimate doom metal song is Into the Void from that album. And they would continue to explore this uh, this idea of doom and gloom on subsequent albums, especially with the Dio stuff, uh, all the way into the 90s with Dehumanizer and stuff like that. But Black Sabbath invented doom in the 70s. Uh, there was a band in the States called Pentagram around the same time. Not quite as heavy at the time as Black Sabbath, but similar. A similar sound, sort of mystical, spooky, heavy, blues-based, but not blues. Hard rock, but a little harder. Uh, But Pentagram didn't really take off in the 70s. It wasn't until the 80s that Bobby Liebling met Victor Griffin and those dudes and uh, the doom, the real legitimate doom metal era of Pentagram began in the 80s. Uh, but in the late 70s on the West Coast, St. Vitus formed. I guess they would be... Uh, them in trouble would probably be the at the forefront of the first wave of what we can call traditional doom metal. The, uh, the guys that loved Sabbath and focused on the slower, sludgier, doomier, scarier stuff, right? And this is a direct line from the origins of metal in general. You had Sabbath was the first metal band. I would say Priest is the second metal band. Uh, Then you had Iron Maiden, Merciful Fate, the style is emerging, right? And and that's when the uh, subgenres started to form. You had the, the early origins of what would become black metal, with Celtic Frost and Merciful Fate and stuff like that. Uh, Then you had, you know, those same bands, I would say, sort of inspired what would become thrash metal with bands like Metallica and Slayer uh, and Black Sabbath and maybe even Merciful Fate and Priest to a degree also seem to have influenced the guys that would form this subgenre called doom metal. We had the big four in the 80s. Uh, St. Vitus, Trouble, Candle Mass in Sweden, Pentagram. And Solitude Eternus came a little bit after that. They formed in Arlington, Texas, uh, which is interesting because there was another band coming up at the same time in Arlington, Texas, a little band called Pantera. And there are moments throughout the Solitude Eternus discography where you can tell that they were coming up in the same scene and in the same environment as Pantera. And to me, that's what kind of gives them, that's one of many things that I would say gives them an edge even over any of those four, big four uh, doom metal bands. That There's quite a few things that I think edge them out uh, and make them the best band out of all of those bands, but that's one of them. They have parts that sort of tickle that same caveman thing that Pantera does. Uh, so the band was founded by John Perez, early 87. Uh, it took him a minute to find a lineup, but finally settled on what I would say is like the classic lineup, which would sort of evolve over the years. Uh, and the live lineup at Hell's Heroes was basically that classic lineup with the later period guitar player also represented in the three guitar lineup. So really a fan's dream come true. Like you couldn't ask for a cooler more old school Solitude Eternus lineup. And they named the band Solitude in part because both Black Sabbath and Candlemass have songs called Solitude, which are clearly at far ends of the spectrum. And let's see, here's an interesting factoid. In 88, they released a demo called And Justice For All, which came out before Metallica's and Justice for All. I spoke in the last episode about arriving at sort of the same riff. Uh, Fenris and myself, unbeknownst to each other, you know, so here's another example of that. However, in this case, I will say in 1987, Agnostic Front put out a record called Liberty and Justice 4, 
dot, 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 which is my favorite agnostic front record. But they were first. They were first, 87. I'm not sure if uh, John Perez or the guys in Metallica were aware of that. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But anyway, put out a demo, uh, got some interest, and recorded their first album in 1990 for three grand. Cranked it out seven days. Uh, but then the label that was supposed to put it out couldn't put it out, ran out of money or something. And so they shopped it around, and the legendary Roadrunner Records picked them up. Uh, there was no tour. Uh, they already had another record ready to go, so they recorded the second album. Let's crack into their discography. I've got all these records behind me. Uh, I will say that my favorite Solitude Eternus record is the first one, Into the Depths of Sorrow. I think it's a perfect record. It's the first one I heard. But that's not to say they're one of these bands that put out a great record and never matched that level of quality. That's not the case at all. I want to stress that every single record is good. We'll get to Downfall, which I would say is maybe the least good one. But, um, man, their last two records are as good as anything they've ever released, for sure. Uh, I know John Perez, who's the main brain of the band, prefers uh, Through the Darkest Hour, which is a phenomenal record. But something about the first one, to me, man, is just magical. I love the cover. It's so early 90s. It makes me think of MTV music videos. Uh Beavis and Butthead, all that kind of stuff. And it it just has a vibe. Like, they firmly establish this vibe that uh, sets them apart from any other metal band. They have things in common with the big four of Doom Metal. Uh, they have things in common with Metallica. They have a little bit in common with Pantera. Like I said, you sort of hear the... Texas hard hitting swagger in some of their riffs. They're not afraid to like hit a breakdown every once in a while. But um I'll put it this way. They have everything that I love about the big four of Doom Metal, but none of the what I would call imperfections or weaknesses of that, those bands. Uh so for example, they have the um they have the sort of like underground punk rock appeal and really super slow, loud, pummeling, pure doom element of St. Vitus. But at the same time, they're better players. Uh, their songs are a little more sophisticated and more interesting. They use different time signatures and stuff like that. Uh, they have the epic guitar harmonies and super high beautiful pitch perfect vocals of trouble but i think they're a little less meandering and a little more consistent and i actually i think robert lowe's vocals are even better than eric wagner's personally uh, there's not as much like super high falsetto-y stuff it's just really powerful more akin to like dio or rob halford or something like that um, they have the the epic Phrygian mode style riffs of candle mass. If you don't know about Phrygian dominant, it's just a scale on the guitar that is very mystical sounding and mysterious, and it's associated with ancient Egypt. And we were on tour and wondering why it's associated with ancient Egypt, because there was a guy in the Netherlands at Into the Grave Fest with all these tattoos telling us about how it was like from the Phrygian language or the Phrygian culture, which predated the Dutch in that area. So then we started wondering, well, why the hell is the Phrygian mode associated with Egypt? Come to find out it's because of Hollywood, like the very first days of Hollywood when they're showing the desert or showing the pyramids or camels or ancient Egypt, the music will be in the Phrygian mode for some reason. And so now, collectively, we have that association drilled into our brain. Uh, but Candlemass uses that a lot. Death uses it. Metallica uses it. Uh, Nile, obviously. Uh, and Candlemass uses it. To great effect. Uh, Solitude Eternus has that same sort of appeal, that mystical kind of sound. But they're not, they don't venture into the cheese element 
that Candlemas does. And I might get destroyed for this, but I, I just think that Solitude has all the cool things about Candlemas and none of the cringy, dorky, cheesy stuff. Um, they, they have the direct line from Sabbath that Pentagram carries so well. Um, but again, they just do it a little bit better. They just, they, they can get just as heavy as Pentagram. Um, but yeah, I think the vocals and the riffs and the, the songs are even better and they're certainly more consistent. Uh, so, I mean, that's me making a case for why I think they might be the most underrated band ever. Uh, and I mentioned earlier, if, if you're late getting into them, don't feel bad because so am I. And before I kind of continue on through their history and their discography here as quickly as possible, I'll tell you how I got into them. And I, I'm sure that when I lived in Arkansas, my friend Chuck from Dead Bird had talked this band up to me. Uh, he's the guy that <laughs> helped Tony Martin era Sabbath finally click for me and so many other cool bands. But a lot of stuff for me back then, it was I was a very, very, very busy boy in a lot of different ways and things were in one ear and out the other. Uh, but I, I didn't explore these guys' catalog until our record, Curse of Conception, was reviewed in Decibel. I believe it was Sean Frazier that wrote this. Uh, shout out Sean Frazier. This is still one of my favorite reviews we got. Um, but he reviewed Curse of Conception 2017 for Decibel, and he talked about our Man of Constant Sorrow cover, bridging the gap between the old school blind fiddler Dick Burnett and Solitude Eternus. And I was like, hmm, that name's familiar. Uh, and then the last paragraph, he talks about uh, the last song on the album. Uh, he says, picture Robert Lowe performing the Beatles' Sun King with Neil Young distantly nodding with approval. Uh, and I'm wondering who Robert Lowe is. Obviously, I know the actor. I don't think he's talking about him. And so I looked up Solitude Eternus and saw Robert Lowe and realized that's who he was talking about. And I checked out that first record. I think at the time it was only on YouTube. And man, by the time I got through that A side, I was like, how am I this far along in this big riff game? And I just discovered something that is one of my favorite albums I've ever heard. And I've just discovered a band that's one of my favorite bands I've ever heard. Crazy. Uh, I don't know if it's because they were just a little little late. You know, the rest of those bands, the, the big four started in the late 70s and sort of were at the height of their activity in the 80s. By the time we get to the 90s, you know, Trouble is sort of branching out. They're recording with Rick Rubin. Their sound is uh, still sort of doom-based, but getting a little more into just straight-up rock and roll and psychedelic influences and stuff like that. St. Vitus is losing singers left and right and kind of struggling to figure out what they're doing. I will say they released Die Healing in the mid-90s, and that's probably my favorite St. Vitus record. But only a couple releases throughout the course of the 90s. Pentagram, same deal. They're sort of faltering. Uh, put one record out in the early 90s, and Review Your Choices came out in 99, which is a great record, but not that active in the 90s. Candle Mass is sort of all over the place. Uh, and guys, you have to understand in the nineties, traditional epic doom metal couldn't been less cool. I wasn't really there. I was too young in the nineties to be aware of any of this stuff, but I do remember what was popular in the metal world. Uh, you know, after solitude put out their second record, they toured with, uh, Paul Diano, you know, the original singer of Iron Maiden, uh, after they put out their third record, they toured with Merciful Fate, but this was before Merciful Fate was connected up with Psycho Las Vegas and super cool, hardworking, plugged in, young booking agents. And uh, in the 90s, they weren't playing big arenas and stuff like that. You know, um, we look at the the OG metal bands 
who, you know, I would say Solitude Eternus is a direct line from those bands, Sabbath, Priest, Iron Maiden. Uh, in the 90s, these guys are kind of falling apart. It looked like Sabbath was going to sort of have a comeback with Dio, you know, Dehumanizer and didn't really work out. Um, they're recording albums with the dude from Body Count and just kind of trying to figure out how to stay relevant, you know. Both Priest and Iron Maiden uh, have lost their singers. They're not playing big places. They're playing clubs and stuff. Uh, and people were trying, like, people were scrambling. Real, real legit metal bands are scrambling to be relevant. <laughs> Even Slayer. I mean, they put out Diabolus. You know, it's got new metal parts on it. If I had to pick one band, one band in the 90s, that was carrying the torch for that direct line of metal that started with Sabbath and has carried on through today into bands like High on Fire and Hellas and whatever. In the 90s, it was Solitude Eternus. Nobody was representing that more than they were. Um, you had some bands like, you know, Sleep is basically doing. Black Sabbath cosplay at that time. Nothing wrong with it. Tony Iommi even said, like, of any band that's ever ripped us off or, you know, emulated us, they did the best job, the most accurate job, right? So not knocking them. But they're, you know, the the first few Sleep albums are really just Sabbath cosplay. Uh, Solitude Eternus obviously has a Sabbath influence, but they were really uh, representing, like, a unique take on the entire history of metal up to that point. Uh, so yeah, that first record came out in 91. Beyond the Crimson Horizon would follow shortly after 92. Uh, it's great. I think I still prefer the first album. This one might be a little more progressive and a little more ambitious. Uh, I, I'm not sure it packs the same punch that the first one does. Uh, and then they went over to England to do Through the Darkest Hour, the third one. And reading that interview that my friend Brad did with, with the guys, sounds like this is when they were really locked in. Every band has that period, you know, for, for my beloved Wake from Little Rock, that period for them was around the time of uh, If You Walk Before You Crawl and Voices of Omens. They were practicing all the time. They were focused with a level of obsession that went beyond any semblance of sanity, you know, and I think Solitude Eternus's locked in period was through the darkest hour and went over to England, did it. I mentioned that song falling the first track, uh, man, if you like black Sabbath, Alice in Chains, acid bath, crowbar, candle mass, any of the big four of doom metal, uh, Jeez, it just channels everything cool about Doom, but also everything cool about the 90s. And, you know, Roadrunner put out the first two records and then they got out of that deal, uh, I think partially because they never got the tour support funds that they were supposed to receive. Seems like it was always some shit like that with Roadrunner. Uh, so at this point, they're on Pavement, which at the time was sort of a new upstart label, from what I understand. If they had, like if Solitude Eternus had put out Through the Darkest Hour on Roadrunner and gotten the attention and the backing from the label that they deserved and Falling had been shopped to radio the same way that like uh, Black Number One Typo Negative was shopped to radio by Roadrunner, they would have had a hit, I think. I really think it... it and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's not to diminish the artistic merit of the song because it whoops ass. Like there's even a really weird time signature evil old school doom section in the middle of it. Uh, but it's just, man, it's four minutes long. It's got a verse from hell that gets stuck in your head. It's got one of the best choruses I've ever heard in a rock song. And, uh, it just, it's baffling. I don't know. 1994 was just, uh, 
not the greatest time for real badass metal, I guess. Um, the next record, Downfall, is kind of <laughs> titled appropriately, I think. It's not a bad record, but the production is just not there. It just, uh, and I would, I will say, you know, as much, Arthur, I know how much you love this record. I don't want to disparage it or anything like that, but you're starting to hear that they're maybe a little bit uninspired compared to the previous few albums. Um, there's nothing that just knocks your socks off as much as falling or transcending Sentinels from the first album or Destiny Falls to Ruin from the first album. Uh, however, two years later in 1998, they will have a triumphant return with Adagio, which they went back to England to record from what I understand. Uh, I would say the highlight of this one for me is Lament, track 10. I feel like it should have been on the A side at least. Um, it It's a very dirgy song that uh, sort of lulls you into like a trance, but then they, man... They hit you with something uh, that makes it obvious they're from the same area as Pantera. I'll just put it that way. It's every bit as badass as like the breakdown from Domination or something. Uh, this record also has, you know, as proud as I am of our uh, our Supernaut cover, I got to say the best Black Sabbath cover I've ever heard is Solitude Eternus' version of Heaven and Hell. I almost want to say I like it more than the original. And along with my candle mass comments, that might be the thing that gets me crucified the most off of this episode. Uh, great album. Like I said, I think their last two records are just as good as anything else they did. Uh, I was listening. I was sort of doing some brushing up or some research or whatever you want to call it. And I listened to the last album yesterday it's called alone came out in 2006 uh, they had an eight year gap between those two records i'm sure things were just slowing down life was happening again this is a style of music that was just not in vogue uh look at the worst year for metal ever 1997 google what's the best metal record of 1997 and look at the state of things <laughs> in 1997 it's not good. I, I think 97 is the worst, and um, 2022 is the second, second worst year for metal. Uh, but it seems like we're getting back on track now that Solitude Eternus is back together. But in, in 2006, they put out their last record, Date Alone, uh, really going back to the Phrygian, mystical, scary-sounding stuff. Uh, they They just have such a strong ability to take yeah spooky creepy mystical egyptian sounding riffs break your neck black sabbath pantera straight up bluesy pentatonic riffs uh odd time signatures you know i, I think the two bands that laid the foundation for metal are sabbath and zeppelin you know zeppelin was a little bit more of like a mystical hard rock thing what Zeppelin did a lot better and a lot more frequently than Sabbath is weird time signatures. Uh, if you want to know what I'm talking about, like the ocean is a perfect example. Cashmere is a perfect example. Most rock songs are in four. One, two, three, four, right? And the whole song is counted to four. Um, when you start throwing in measures of five or seven or randomly throwing in a measure of six, you know, Metallica Sanitarium, the verses, the clean parts, that's a good example. Uh, Solitude somehow can still really pummel you with odd time signatures. A lot of times you, you lose where the groove is or where the meat of the riff is when people start using weird time signatures like that. But uh, this record is just like all of the best traits of the band illustrated to the max you know and something that really makes a loan stand out is the vocal production uh there's a lot of doubling but the usually when you double a vocal they're on top of each other and the intention is to make it sound like one vocal that's just very powerful 
Ozzy does this. James Hetfield does it on the old Metallica records. Uh, but on Alone, he's doubling his vocal and they're panning it left and right. And he's doing, on a lot of it, he's doing two very different takes. Like the enunciation and the mood of the takes will be real different. So you hear, you feel like you're hearing voices in your head or something. And some of the stuff that, you know, there's two lead vocals that aren't exactly the same. And then there's like whispering going on. And there's like the low talking Phil Anselmo, Great Southern Trend Kill, creepy voice going on. And there's shouting and howling. And uh, some of these songs, it sounds like there's six or eight vocal tracks going on at the same time. And it's really a fun listen on headphones, especially. But um, man, there's not that many metal bands that have more than a few albums. And I find it necessary to own their entire catalog. But as you can see, Solitude Eternus is one of those bands. Uh, check them out. That's it. I hope that I've uh, intrigued you rather than bored you to death. But I, I want to put the utmost respect on Solitude Eternus for being the band that carried forth what's probably my favorite subgenre of metal through a decade where it was underappreciated, underrewarded, taken for granted, not in vogue, and they didn't fucking care. They did it anyway. And uh, my hat's off to you. And that's important work that Solitude Eternus did for metal. I'm so glad they're back together. I hope they do a new record. I would love that. I'm sure a lot of other people would as well. Uh, so there's my Solitude Eternus deep dive. I don't think I forgot anything. Let me think. Hmm. Of course, there's other bands in the 90s that were playing like real metal. You know, Crowbar was always there. I Hate God. Pantera. Um, but there's something about Solitude that just seems like for those of us who are um, fanaticals, fans, you know, scholars, who want to understand the whole picture, there is like a vein that started with Sabbath. And it's like they're the heart. And there's a vein coming out of that heart. And it branches off in different directions. Uh, and only a few of the best and most significant and important bands branched off of those veins. And Solitude Eternus is one of them, for sure, for sure. One of the best and most important metal bands. Okay, I'm done. That's enough. Uh, fan questions, here we go. Dave from Wales with the paid question. Thank you, Dave. Hi, Nate, as ever, I'm loving the podcast and I have a question for you. I'm Dave, a 50-something metalhead with a desire to attempt to keep up to date with the current metal scene, which is easier said than done. Fortunately, your podcast has helped point the way towards some new, great new bands. Sovereign, Inter Arma, and unfortunately, Argo Slint. <laughs> How is it even possible for a person bereft of any decency towards his fellow man to write riffs this good? Uh, man, I just don't believe that guy. I don't know, he's hanging out on the border. He's just a normal, regular jack-off trying to uh, trigger people or whatever. Um, and I will say all those bands you just mentioned... I know for a fact they're not recording their albums on a laptop in a Scarlet 2i2 and then uh, getting some amateur to mix them. They're making real records. So that's the difference. That's probably why you like them. Take some effort. It takes a little bit of effort. All you kids that think uh, playing in a live band and touring is going to be a similar effort to uh, plugging into a Scarlet and all that, yeah. I'm sure you're finding out that it's not the same amount of effort. Okay, back to Dave. I own and run a gym in Cardiff, Wales. It's an old school free weights gym that also runs Muay Thai and MMA classes, which sounds like it's right up your alley. Yes, it is. Next time we're there, I'm come in, dude. Kick some shit. Uh, were you ever supposed to play with Orange Goblin in Cardiff a couple years ago? Or did I just dream about it? Anyway, that's not my question. This is. 
I'm currently listening to the Hail Fenris episode and it got me thinking, do you have a favorite metal super group? And if you were to form one, who would you pick as your bandmates? You're allowed four other musicians, living or dead. Uh, for the record, my number one super group is a tie between Bloodbath and Down. Uh, even though it wasn't your question, I am going to answer it. We were booked to play with Orange Goblin and Cardiff, but COVID was still going on and travel was uncertain. We didn't even know if we'd be able to legally fly to the country or enter the country or quarantine for two weeks, even though the tour was one week. Uh, so we had to cancel, unfortunately. Um, now for the actual question. I think down is probably the best outcome of a super group where mm, the music lives up to the hype. I want to mention Shrine Builder. You guys remember that band? Shrine Builder is Wino, Scott Kelly from Neurosis, Dale Crover from the Melvins, Al Cisneros from Sleep and Ohm. And they made one record, fell apart, but it's good. It's as good as you would hope that it would be. Uh, technically, Bad Company is a super group. One of my favorite bands. Paul Rogers, one of my favorite singers. Uh, the drummer. I think he took the drummer from Free. Great drummer. Uh, I think the other dudes are from Mott the Hoople or some shit. I never got into that band. Uh, Blind Faith is a super group. That uh, first and I guess only Blind Faith record is amazing. It's the only thing Eric Clapton ever did that I really love. I would say Queens of the Stone Age songs for the deaf is technically a super group as well. Technically. Uh, yeah. As far as my super group, if I could assemble one, you said I get four other musicians. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to do like a realistic one and then I'm going to do one that's comprised of, uh, apparitions, ghouls, specters, demons, angels, however you want to refer to the dearly departed. But the realistic one is like actually pretty damn realistic. Uh, drums, you mentioned Inter Arma. I'm going to go with TJ Childers from Inter Arma on drums. Bass, Jeff Matz from High on Fire and Mutoid Man. I think he is the most remarkable and interesting bass player in heavy music right now. Again, it's that perfect line of... Uh, technical proficiency and just raw feeling and heaviness. That's a tricky line to find sometimes. And Jeff has definitely found it as has TJ. Uh, I guess I'd be on guitar. Uh, second guitar, Graham from Annihilation Time and Witch. And I think he's got a band in Australia now called Stepmother or something. And on vocals, Melanie Parsons from Royal Thunder my favorite current rock or metal, I don't know, hard rock singer. So yeah, drums, TJ from Inner Arma, bass, Jeff from High on Fire, guitar, me, guitar, Graham from Annihilation Time, vocals, Melanie Parsons. Uh, that would rule. Okay, here's the fantasy dead people super group. Drums, John Bonham, bass, Phil Linnett from Thin Lizzy. I'm going to cheat and ha I have an extra member in this one. Guitar, me. Guitar, Dimebag Daryl. Guitar, Jimi Hendrix. Vocals, Ronnie James Dio. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what those hangouts would be like? The, the practice sessions? I can hear that band. I know exactly what it would sound like. Be great. I think we'd all be taking orders from Dio, though, if I had to guess. And probably dodging beer bottles thrown by John Bonham. Okay, Murray. Next email. Murray, I love your style of email, dude. Here, here it is. Ideas for you to interview, colon. Leif Edling from Candlemass. Fenris. What's weird is Murray sent me this right after I got done recording the Fenris episode, but before it was out. Crazy. Why no? That would be a fun one. Uh, producer Billy Anderson. You could talk about the role that producers play his discography is amazing. Yeah, man. Uh, I've hung with Billy a couple times. He's recorded all my friends' bands and classic timeless albums. Again, making a record is making a record. Recording songs on your computer and paying somebody to mix them isn't a record. 
recording with Billy Anderson, that's making a record. Uh, Mortise, that would be fun. I have a really funny story about Mortise that I don't know if I'm allowed to tell, but it involves him trying something for the first time that you should be careful trying for the first time and his heart stopped and they had to bring him back to life like Pulp Fiction. <laughs> I'll save that for another time. I got to make sure I got, uh, I got approval to tell that one. Okay. Last email, Johnny. Hey, Nate, love the show, man. I'm a more recent listener, but have gone through the back catalog and found the podcast to be really refreshing. You and I are somewhat in the same age range and I connect with your experiences so much. Um, I have had a thirst for music for my whole life and have yet to quench it. Similar to you, it's taken me back in time and has meandered into new unknown regions of the sonic universe. Uh, he goes on to talk about one of the most profound moments of his life is getting vulgar display of power by Pantera in his stocking. He heard it when he was 10 years old and then getting into the vulgar videos and you could just tell they were something special and then it made you feel connected to him. The vulgar videos... For better or worse, I'm not blaming anybody. I believe wholeheartedly in personal responsibility. Uh, that seems to be a crazy thought these days that anybody on earth is responsible for their own actions and behavior and consequences. But I'm a firm believer in it. So I'm not blaming Pantera. But I will say, the vulgar videos is why I started drinking. <laughs> that was like, when I saw the way those guys were living, I was like, okay, uh, you know, you see the the consequences of that years later. They don't show you that part, but uh, at the time, I wanted to be those guys. I'm sure everybody did that saw those. Okay. One question I have is, how do you, someone who has a significant background with Pantera, feel about the revival shows? I'm just interested in your take on everything with this tour. From what I've seen, they've done a really great job at paying homage to the original material. Uh, da, 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 da. Mm, looking forward to hearing your take. Okay. Well, okay. He says that I believe Rex and Phil along with Charlie and Zach are doing the right thing for the Abbott brothers impact on the music world and our overall legendary legacy. Um, yeah, man, it's none of my business. I, I did fucking rip lamp of murmur to shreds on this episode, which I debated doing because the thing is, is I'm in this world and these people, I wouldn't say Pantera are my peers, or anything like that, but we are in the same circles. Like we know all the same people we operate in the same system and everything. So I try not to like, uh, I don't have a bad opinion really on the Pantera thing, but I, you know, it's none of my fucking business. None of my business whatsoever. Uh, I've heard some things here and there that explain to me why they're doing it. You know, I, I would love for them to not like, record any new music as Pantera. I don't think that would be right. I see people talking about that. I don't think they're planning on doing that. If they did a live record, that'd be fine. Yeah. You know, I heard rumblings about this happening way before it was public information. And it was obvious to me that if they were going to do it, it was going to be Zach on guitar and Charlie on drums. Even before that was confirmed, I, I have a witness. I have a witness who can testify to me being like, well, if they do that, it's obviously going to be Charlie. Uh, everybody knew it was going to be Zach. You know, we don't know what the brothers would think about it because they're not here. So who's left? Their families. And from what I understand, their families were the ones that were encouraging this. Uh, and I think, you know, I see the person being criticized the most is Zach for some reason. And I don't like that. I, from what I understand, Zach was kind of the last person to get on board with it. And he, you can kind of tell, uh, this is not insider information. Just looking at videos, of these guys hanging out and stuff, you can kind of tell that Zach is the one that's probably the most uncomfortable with it, which I respect, man. But I, I'm sure that he put a lot of thought into the decision and the decision is very, meaningful to him and I don't know these guys uh I I have friends that knew Dime very very well if I had to guess if the Pantera thing had to happen and Dime and Vinny could choose who they wanted it to be obviously they're gonna have Zach do it obviously so who the fuck are you or me or anybody else to criticize that 
uh, it ain't got nothing to do with us at all. And you know what? Dimebag's playing his riffs and his leads and his solos and everything. I see like YouTube guitarists putting up videos like everyone's playing this Dimebag Daryl solo wrong. Everybody's playing this Pantera riff wrong. Here's how you play it. And they proceed to play it fucking wrong. <laughs> they play it wrong. The thing about a guy like Dimebag is there was so much personality and subtle, inconsistent, unpredictable expression with his left hand. Uh, I'm talking about bends in weird places. I'm talking about vibrato in weird, very specific places. He's speaking through his instrument. Uh, and the, the number one mistake that I see from, I don't know, like social media guitarists or, or anybody like learning the instrument is that they're playing everything quote unquote right. But Dimebag Daryl didn't play everything right. You know, let's go back to the riff I was talking about on the last episode. Ale Gagan Ale. Um, Dark Throne. Find the riff. It goes wow no 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 no. If you look up a tab of that riff, it's just power chords on certain frets. And that's not how it's played. It's power chords being bent way the fuck out of tune and vibratoed way out of tune. There's a slide with just your index finger up to a fret and then a power chord on that fret bent out and you're bending in very specific spots. You're bending it out of tune on purpose. Uh, this is a great example of what I'm talking about. Someone tabbed that out and did not translate any of that in the tab. And so if you sit there and play the tab, you might think you're playing it right, but you're not because the right way to play it is as wrong as pot. Like that's what gives it the attitude. And that's something that has to be understood in your bones. You can't really teach somebody how to play guitar like a fucking outlaw, like a truly wild criminal minded, uh, <laughs> cowboy or whatever. You can't teach that. You have to have that. And Dimebag had that. And Zach has it. And there's nobody. I saw all these people. Why wouldn't they get somebody that has this Instagram and YouTube account where all they do is play Dimebag Daryl stuff and they play it perfect. They're not playing it perfect. They're not playing it perfect. Because they probably never been in a small town on tour on an off day and dosed themselves and everybody else with acid and wrecked the town and got arrested and had to get bailed out by their tour manager. You know, they probably haven't sat in their dad's studio for years on end watching country bands, session guys, chicken pickers on guitar. You know, that was in Dimebag's bones, man. And that's in Zach Wilde's bones. Uh, I got way off track there. I got into like a completely different fucking philosophical topic there. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, man, uh, what I think about the Pantera reunion doesn't matter. And, you know, I feel the same way about what all that bullshit that was going on with the power trip thing after they played a few songs for fun at the Mohawk. And there was this big fucking uproar about it. It's like what I think doesn't matter. What you think doesn't matter. If you're listening to this, uh, if you're not a part of dimes estate or Vinny's estate, or your name ain't Phil Anselmo, Charlie Benante, Zach Wilde, Rex Brown, or maybe Grady Champion, then your opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> Let them do what they're going to do. You know, who cares? And uh, yeah, man, Zach playing Floods. Go watch him play Floods and tell me that anybody else would do a better job because they wouldn't. Maybe TJ from Inter Arma. You know what? Uh, even though he's the drummer, I would say TJ, TJ would be the second best choice to accurately play those nine bag Daryl guitar parts. That's a guy that gets it. That's a guy that was opening for fog hat when he was <laughs> nine years old or whatever. You see my point. You, you can't teach this stuff. You have to have it, you know, and you can earn it, but, uh, 
it takes more than just sitting around practicing your instrument. You got to, you got to like put some dirt on your soul or something, you know? So that's how I feel about Zach Wilde and Pantera and all that. Can't even remember what the damn question was. Yeah, man, listen to, uh, if you love traditional epic doom metal, uh, this is doom metal with riffs. This is doom metal with fast parts, mid tempo, baseball bat to the head parts, slow Sabbathy parts. This is not the doom of the modern era where you're getting bombarded with one chord every 90 seconds and a bunch of Sun Model T feedback and you're wondering uh, what you're going to make for lunch tomorrow. And then you snap back to reality and you realize, oh shit, I'm at a show. There's a band playing. I forgot. Uh, I'm talking about epic riffs. Doom metal has riffs. If it ain't got riffs, guess what? It ain't doom metal. It's just people that don't know how to fucking play anything else. Uh, but if you like epic doom metal, start with the first record and listen to all of them. If you don't make it through downfall, it's understandable. If we're going to do a tier ranking like the kids do, you have S tier, A tier, B tier. Every album is an S tier. Except for downfall. Sorry, Arthur. I think even Solitude would agree with me. Downfall I put in B, mainly because of the production. Maybe C, B, C, B minus. Everything else, S tier. Start with the first record. Listen to all of them. If you're not that into traditional, super epic doom metal, uh, but you like Alice in Chains, Acid Bath, Crowbar, New Orleans stuff, Black Sabbath, whatever, listen to the song Falling. And then listen to that album. And then start from the beginning. Is Solitude Eternus the most underrated metal band ever? The most criminally underappreciated metal band ever? Who do you think is the most underappreciated metal band? If you put together your big four of doom metal, who would it be? Because mine's a little bit different than what's uh, commonly accepted as the big four. Thank you, Solitude Eternus. You guys were awesome. Thank you, Hell's Heroes. Best fest in the States. Sorry, Lamp of Murmur fans. Um, you know what? I don't blame them for not putting in more effort when we're living in a society where once people have decided that something is good because it's hyped up, there's not much you can do, including playing a dog shit, awful, terrible 15 minute late set to convince them otherwise. And on the flip side, once people are convinced something sucks, there's not much you can do to convince them otherwise. Uh, I try to keep an open mind, but um, I ain't buying it. See you next episode. Thanks, guys.